this building that we turn and my PhD candidate from the University of Macau. So this is the title of my topic today. So we are for a good, but good. We can do it. Okay. So our body, our biology is made up of many, many components, many molecules and many atoms in it. But at the center of it, it's our DNA that is at the core of everything that is what we call life. And with such complex system, it, it is very prone to many sources of DNA damage. It could be from our environment, from our lifestyle, from our diet, or even from our own uh, cellular activities in our body. All these uh, sources can cause what we call DNA damage. And DNA damage can cause many diseases, from cancer to brain diseases and even other alterations of our body. So how can we do or monitor these uh, DNA damages? Fortunately, we have the technology nowadays. We have DNA sequencing. And uh, as we, we all know, everyone heard from all the previous uh, presenters that DJI uh, also do this uh, DNA sequencing technology. In fact, they're leading it. So this is one of the technologies that I think I would consider one of the amazing feats of humankind, uh, akin to the Apollo missions to the moon, but at the biology uh, field. Uh, if you can see that the cost for human genome just uh, 20 years ago was about uh, 100 million per, per one human genome. But now we were able, this year, the average globally is around uh, 1,000 US dollars. And just recently I also learned that BGI has a technology now to make it less than 99 US dollars, which is amazing. So now we have the technology to see and monitor this DNA damage. What are the types of DNA damage that we can see? So we have many types of we have uh, repeat expansion mutations, insertion mutations, deletion mutations, and even nonsense mutations. So all of these most likely yields a non-functional protein. But how about this sense mutation? This sense mutation replaces exactly one uh, nucleotide base in the DNA sequence. And this causes exactly one amino acid change in the protein level. So here's the question, would they yield a non-functional protein? So how do we try to classify the effects of these uh, uh, distance mutations? Uh, according to the ACMG guidelines, there are five levels of classifications. So with one pathogenic being the disease causing, and uh, benign would be non-disease causing. But we are lacking one specific, we're not lacking, more like we're doing too much here, is because we, the uncertain significance of the US. If we look at the just one chromosome, we have many chromosomes in our genome. Just in one chromosome, in chromosome one, 68.8 percent of the uncovered DNA variants uh, from the clinical uh, settings are actually classified as PUS. It even gets worse when we focus on DNA uh, specific genes. If you look at DNA damage repair genes, the missense mutation variant classification, 92 percent of them are variants of unknown significance. So we have a wealth of data, but we don't know what we will do in the context of our uh, genome. Do we, does it do any harm to us or not? Normally, to uncover this, we do population studies or experimental functional tests. These are quite expensive and time consuming, although we, there's a lot of efforts which does this work. So people also try to do software uh, in silico tools. But well, recently, according to ACMG, there are some problems. First, the conflicting results, and second, it's, it's known to overpredict tolerated variants of deleterious. The tolerated means that uh, it's actually not disease causing, and deleterious is disease causing. So many of these uh, have a problem of saying that, oh, if you have a specific mutation, it's, a, it's bad for you. So why is this uh, almost equally bad as under prediction? Because, for example, if you have breast cancer mutation, if you are uh, diagnosed with uh, high risk of breast cancer, you could undergo a very life changing surgery of uh, removing your uh, breast. So, it's also equally important for us to not over predict 
but at the same time, make sure that we get all of the bad uh, uh, variants. So yeah, the big question is, suppose that we have a risk sets introduced, what is the functional protein when it changes to exactly one amino acid only? So here we are, well, this is where my research comes in. It's called uh, Darwin. And you can remember it as kind of Charles Darwin, but with a C and I there, uh, Charles Darwin. So it stands for the hydro angle reliant viral impact classifier. So the workflow is quite simple. For every genetic variant, we try to reflect the protein structure change, which is usually just on one amino acid change for this sense. Uh, variants, then we plug it into the uh, machine learning algorithm to try to predict the functional effect of a missense variant. You might have a question, what is the input then? To understand the input, the foundation of Darwin is actually from the Chandra's principle from 1973. So he stated that it is the principle that phi and psi angles determine the conformation of the polypeptide. So this is a polypeptide made up of many amino acids. And each amino acid, there are two angles, or so you can see here, uh, near the carbon alpha uh, atom, the phi and psi angles there. That is, uh, each amino acid has its own. And these two angles actually, theoretically, should be able to take the whole 360 degrees. But uh, with, because of the size of the atoms, there are Van der Waals forces that prevents them from taking all of the values possible. So we can see in the animation that all of those uh, color uh, highlighted are what we call stereo flashes. So these are angle values that are not possible for these type of sequence. So we can use this uh, comparing the molecular dynamic simulation. Our proteins in our body are not static. They are moving, dynamic, always. So it's more important for us to use uh, readings from a dynamic structure. So when we perform molecular dynamic simulation, we take the dihedral angles for every time point that uh, this uh, molecule is moving in. And then from there, uh, we do the machine learning. So our main input are actually the phi and psi angle readings. So in our research, we apply this in uh, the new T, uh, gene and the T53 uh, gene. So we try to prove a uh, concept first that is a workable uh, approach. So for the research, the results. So the first um, finding is quite a uh, good insight for us to approach a how do we look at a very complex protein. Like it's very moving very erratically and randomly. How do we do to quantify it? So what the first finding shows us is that each of the dihedral angle actually adopts a normal distribution. So it doesn't just go 360 degrees around the specific angle, or else that will be a too flexible protein. So with this, I, uh, we can use uh, data descriptors to describe the distribution. So this is one way to do the uh, quantification of a protein. Next finding is that when you perform uh, simulations repeatedly, uh, we can see that there are some angles that are more how to say, stable across time in the simulation repeats. Uh, for example, 293 side to the left is actually found in the tail end of this protein structure. So we can see that it's very uh, random almost, the uh, values that it takes. But for uh, very uh, stable, uh, angle within the secondary structure, uh, you can see that the values are e having an equilibrium. So with this, we can isolate which angles are can we look at to infer this uh, structural change. And then now that we know this, and well, which type of data descriptor can we use to describe the distribution, the behavior of these angles? We found that the uh, intercorporal range uh, performs best in uh, uh, making a prediction for function. So later, after this, the next finding will be we are curious whether, because we're observing one act, uh, group of angles only, to try to reflect the whole protein uh, movement. So we are curious if it's actually localized or actually uh, uh, reflecting the general local protein level. 
So what we found, for example, these are two, uh, two variants. These are R242 cysts, these are pathogenic. Just, and then the other one, VAL243, is a benign uh, variant. So we can see that the, the way, the location of the angles are actually shifting, even though it's a one, uh, small and massive change. And furthermore, how does the model, what is the difference that the model sees between the, the, the distributions? So this is the next insight, is that the shape of the distribution is actually what will help us uh, differentiate between what is tolerated and a deleterious variant. As we can see here, the tolerated uh, variant has low variability, while the, uh, at the same angle, there's a high variability for the distribution of the uh, angle for the deleterious uh, one. So the shape of the distribution is important. So we can interpret this. If an angle is high variability, it's quite loose at that uh, point of this, the protein structure, uh, as opposed to uh, more rigid at the low variability. So we try to see if this performs well compared to other silico methods. So we take to just uh, introduce again how we evaluate it. So for every model, we made a testing data set. So this data set are made up of functionally validated variants only. We try to refrain from predicting phenotype because that's a very next level of the, uh, the effect of the gene. So we try to be a bit more conservative, just predicting the protein uh, level function. And uh, here is the, usually the training set are these. Uh, from the database, and then the, uh, the testing set for the following, from all experiments we validated from, by other labs. So we realized that the garment is performing very well with a higher balanced accuracy. And we also wanted to make sure that uh, for the US classification, it how it's a bit more conservative than others, because we don't want it to look thick. So we find that garment is a little bit more balanced and conservative in its prediction as opposed to other. Uh, uh, methods. And to prove its robustness, the approach of the approach we try to perform the TPTG gene again, applying all the same philosophies. And we were able to predict uh, with 94% balance accuracy the functional level at the protein level. So for concluding remarks, the study has brought insight on how certain angles behave in dynamic protein structure. And uh, for this one, we were able to apply this protocol for the classification in UT, US. And the project was able to make a model that is better at, uh, than other models at the moment in classifying experimentally validated UT and TPG variants. And for the possible applications, Darwin can be a sampling interpreter, or it could work with other in silico methods. Because Darwin is more on a protein level, I think. Uh, we can also still use the other incidental methods and then fine tune the, the, the topic so to minimize the prediction tendencies. And uh, lastly, I would like to uh, acknowledge my supervisor, Professor Simon Wang, and special thanks to my one of our postdocs, Dr. Benjamin Tan, and here and to all my group members here in our lab and here to fund them. And also thank you for being like for letting me get this opportunity here to have a talk. And I would like to end this uh, with the quote. So genes are like a story, and the DNA is the language that the story is written in. Every day, and we are getting closer and closer to unlocking the key and to understanding this DNA language. So if, thank you, everyone. If uh, you're interested in further with, uh, research, the online paper is published here. You can scan the QR code, or you can ask me a WeChat to do you want to discuss a little in depth? Because time is limited. And uh, now I'm here for Q&A sessions. Thank you, everyone.